Hi everyone, uh, my name is Paul Nordmark, and this is Honey Out of the Rock. Uh, we have the milk of the word, we have the meat of the word, and we have the honey out of the rock. Where Jesus said, he that believes on me, as the scripture says, out of his be belly or innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The honey out of the rock is the fruit of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit, the natural gifts, the ministry gifts, and how the Holy Spirit works in those things in divine guidance and the different ways that God leads and guides us in his gifts. Um, we've been teaching on the fruit of the Spirit and how it releases what I believe, the gifts of the Spirit. If you really study the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, he was the apostle of apostles. He was the prophet of all prophets. He was the evangelist of all evangelists. He was the teacher of all teachers, and he was the pastor of all pastors. He flowed in all nine fruits, and he flowed in all nine gifts. And if you really look at his life very closely, every miracle that was released was because of a fruit out of his character, the nine fruits of love. So tonight we're going to be teaching on joy and how joy and prophecy are linked together. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Chara in the Greek language is just defined as this. It's the emotional excitement and happiness and gladness in our lives over what God is doing, has done, and is going to do. Okay, so joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. One of the biggest tactics of the enemy is to steal your joy. If he can steal your joy, he can knock you down and you might just quit in your walk of faith. So how do we maintain our joy? Well, I believe God sends people into our life to speak into our life. And, and the Bible says that we're to desire the best gifts. And it said that prophecy is one of the best gifts. And why is that? Okay, Because everybody needs a word of encouragement. Everybody needs a word of comfort. And everybody needs a word to build them up, to keep them from quitting. Okay, We all struggle in life we all battle things in life we all have things that come to us in our life that try to knock us down god wants to send people into your life to build you up to build you up in your inner man to give you strength so you can fully your destiny in god prophecy can be mi misused okay it can be misused and we're going to be talking a little bit about that and in today's world where the prophetic is really being released people need to know um, the dangers of it being delivered in the wrong way, okay? So how do we maintain this joy? You know, Jesus said in John 16, 24, he said that my joy will remain in you. He also said in John 15, 11, he said that your joy would be full, okay? And of course, Nehemiah eight ten says, the joy of the Lord is our strength, Hebrews 12, 2, for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. How did Jesus endure all the torture, all the mockings, all the, you know, everything that came against him? I mean, here you have the creator, the great I am, coming into this world, and it says the ones he came unto rejected him. How did he keep going? It's because Jesus had to learn who he was in the word of God. He had to study the scriptures. And every prophecy that was spoken from Genesis all the way to the last book of the Old Testament pointed to him, the one that would come, the one that would die, the one that would be the Messiah. But Jesus Christ, he had to maintain his joy. He had to maintain his strength. And you know, when times get tough, even the Lord, because he emptied his deity, he walked down off of his throne. He became a man. It says he struggled in all ways as we do. He was tempted in all ways as we are tempted, yet he was without sin. Okay, he knew how to maintain his joy. He knew how to maintain his strength. And I believe Jesus Christ looked way into the future, and he saw you with him. He saw me with him. He said, it's worth it. I'm going to go through the torture because when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me but not my will, thine be done. He had to look into the future and say, if there's no other way, I got to go through because I want everyone with me that will choose to believe in me. I want them to experience what I experience. I want them to experience the God kind of life, the Zoe life, the way the Father and the Son live 
in the fruit of the Spirit, okay? The things that they have prepared for those that love them, we can't even imagine how incredibly great they are. Words can't even articulate in our language how powerful and great the things that are prepared for those that love God the Father and Jesus Christ and have accepted them into their life. So prophecy, we're going to look at different ways that the gift of prophecy operated in Jesus' life as a prophet, okay? John 1, 41 through 42. It, Jesus it says he, when you met Peter, he, it said, Jesus looked intently at Peter for a moment and said, you are Simon, John's son, but you shall be called Peter the Rock. Long before Peter became the Rock, Jesus gave him a new name. He said that upon you, Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter was a very wishy-washy man and Jesus prophesied into his life. He said, you are, the, you are a rock. You are a boulder, Peter. You're unmovable. You are strong in faith. You are strong in your belief in me. And of course, Jesus, his first the first person that came to Christ was Peter. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But then he denied him. And then Jesus had to restore him back to his calling. Okay, so Peter received a word of prophecy into his life. And then it looked like it wasn't going to come to pass. Jesus restored him. And then it did come to pass. Okay, so Jesus looked into Peter and saw him not for what he was then, but what he was going to become. That's why the gift of prophecy... Um, you know, as a seer gift, as a prophetic gift, a seer gift, God gives you the ability to see not where a person's at now, but where he has them going, okay? So Nathaniel is the other one that Jesus pretty much prophesied into, okay? As, as they were going to get Nathaniel, okay, as they approached Jesus, Jesus said, here comes an honest man, a true son of Israel. Because in the office of a prophet, a New Testament prophet, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, discernment of spirits, and the gift of prophecy work together in different ways. And in this case, Jesus was reading who Nathaniel was even before he met him. Okay, he said, here comes an honest man with no deception in him. Or one translation says, no guile a true son of Israel. And Nathanael said to Jesus, how do you know what I'm like? Jesus said, I could see you under the fig tree, Nathanael. And he says, sir, you are the son of God. Okay, and then Jesus answered this and he said, do you believe all this because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? I tell you the truth. You will even see heaven open and the angels of God coming back and forth to me, the Messiah. Jesus was basically prophesying into Nathaniel's life right there that he had given him a seer gift, that he was going to see into the realm of the spirit, and he was going to see angels descending and ascending to Jesus Christ. Okay, I believe God was showing Nathaniel right there that I see you, but now I see what you're going to be doing. Okay. Now the other way prophecy can work. Okay. Mary, this is one of the most the greatest example of how prophecy is really supposed to work in the New Testament. Mary had three prophecies about who she was carrying in her belly from the angel Gabriel who said very soon now you will become pregnant and have a baby boy and you are to name him Jesus. He shall be great, and you shall, he shall be called the Son of God, okay? And then in Luke 1, 41 through 55, it's a long story. But here you got Elizabeth that had a prophecy that her husband received from the same angel that she was going to become pregnant in her very old age. Elizabeth, the barren one, okay, was going to conceive and birth John the Baptist, okay? But Mary... It says that Mary took off and went and saw Elizabeth, I believe, because she had to get out of town. You know, sometimes we get ridiculed over what God's doing in our life. People start talking. They start putting us down. They start questioning. And in that time, Mary ran to Elizabeth. 
okay? And she's pondering all this in her heart, how she can be carrying the Son of God inside of her, never knowing a man. And is this true? You know, we don't know what she was going through emotionally, spiritually, physically. This is, you know, the first lady that ever received this news on the planet, right? Okay, so the first thing that Mary that Elizabeth experiences when she sees Mary is she says first of all she says for every promise of God will come true what an honor that the mother of my Lord should visit me and then it says the baby inside of her leaped for joy and Mary said oh how I praise the Lord and rejoice in God my Savior so what she had received from Elizabeth in that word, and you can read it in Luke 1, 41 through 55, confirmed what the angel Gabriel told her. Okay? A word of encouragement confer confirms what God is doing in your life. It gives you comfort, and it gives you strength to carry on. Okay? So Mary received comfort. This is true. You know, this is true. This is happening to me. And she re received strength because she said, oh, how I praise the Lord and rejoice in God my Savior. It's in praise and rejoicing. It's in joy that we receive strength to carry on. It's in depression and the other things that are opposite of joy that cause us to be knocked down in life. So how do we maintain our joy? God is probably going to send someone into your life that will give you a word of encouragement to build you up, to pull you up, to lift you up out of the muck and mire and set your feet upon a rock, Jesus Christ. Like it says in Psalms, that God pulled David up out of the muck and mire and set his feet upon the rock, okay? Where he received strength to carry on. So for the joy that was set before Jesus Christ, he endured the cross. For the joy that came to Mary right there, through a word of confirmation, she received strength to carry on, okay, in what God had called her to do. So then the third confirmation that Mary received was Simeon. And I'm just going to paraphrase. You know, Simeon was an old man, it says. And the Holy Spirit in Luke 2, 25 through 38, it's a long story. The Holy Spirit, it says, had revealed to Simeon that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. And then it goes on to say that one morning Simeon woke up and he was prompted by the Spirit to go to the temple that day. And this is a key in divine guidance. Someday you might be prompted when you wake up some morning to go somewhere because God has a divine appointment for you. The prompting of the Spirit, it's a prompting to go somewhere, it's a prompting to say something. Like in the gift of prophecy, it's a prompting, an unction from the Holy One, a prompting to say something to someone to build them up. Or it's a prompting here to give something to someone, to bless them in divine gift giving, not to the letter of the law or sound like you have to through compulsion, but spirit-led giving, the highest form of giving that there is. Okay, so Simeon woke up one morning, and he had a prompting of the Spirit. I call it a flutter. It's almost like the Holy Spirit is tickling you right here in your inner man, right here, to go somewhere that day. Why do I feel like going there? Because God has something special for you there in a divine appointment. Mary and Joseph were bringing Jesus to the temple that day to obey the Old Testament, okay? And when Simeon saw Jesus, he said, he held up Jesus, and he said, Lord, I can die now, for I have seen the Savior of the world. Now, when Mary and Joseph saw that, keep in mind that Mary had already received the message from the angel. She had already received the message from Elizabeth, but now Jesus was born. And now God gave, God gave her a third confirmation that this truly is the Son of God that was going to take the sins of the people away, okay? So Simeon had a word for Mary and Joseph, and it says in the text that they marveled because we're forgetful. 
we're forgetful in our life. You know, this is why God tends to repeat himself in the Bible. You know, this is why Matthew said it, Mark said it, Luke said it. This is why John said it, Peter said it, James said it. They might have said it in a slightly different way, but it means the same thing. Because God confirms his word in our life over and over and over. And if he has to do it four times to get our attention, he will. Because after Simeon released that word over Mary and Joseph, guess who comes along? It says there was a lady named Anna from the tribe of Asher. And this is a key because Asher means happiness. The tribe of Asher means happy. Okay? So Anna, it says she never left the temple. She worked, worshipped. She was an old lady that just worshipped God. And through prayer and fasting, she was called to intercessory prayer. She, I believe, was praying for the coming of the Messiah. And God let her see him. Because it says in the text that she came along as Simeon was talking to Mary and Joseph, telling everyone that the Messiah had arrived. Fourth confirmation, Anna the prophetess. You see how God works in our life? So you don't have to be in the office of a New Testament prophet to receive a word of encouragement from somebody. It's a prompting of the spirit to just say something to somebody that's spirit-led that's going to lift them up. Everybody can be used in the gift of prophecy. And the danger in the gift of prophecy is God doesn't want us chasing a prophet for guidance. Okay, notice this. Mary was not expecting that Gabriel to show up. Was she praying for that? No. Was she expecting to get a word from Elizabeth when she went to her? No. How about Simeon when they went to the temple that day? Was she seeking a word from God? Probably not. And then Anna was the fourth confirmation. What I'm saying is that God knows what you need when you need it. If he chooses to use someone to give you a word of confirmation in your life, when he uses the outer court of our temple, since we are the temple of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, this is the outer court, our physical ears. When God uses the word of confirmation two or three times, or maybe even four in your life, God's really trying to get you to, to see something that you, he doesn't want you to miss it. It's that important. Because we're a three-part person and we can get confused in the other way God leads and guides us in our life. He, you can't get confused with the word of confirmation. You can't get confused with the word of confirmation. If you hear a very similar word two or three times or four times, if God has to use the fourth time, then pay attention to that because that is truly a word from God for you. Okay? Now, the New Testament prophet is not set in the church to guide God's people because in the Old Testament, no one had the Holy Spirit except for the prophet, priest, and king. That's why they needed divine guidance from the prophet, priest, or king. Everyone born again in the New Testament has the Holy Spirit. But we need to learn to follow him. We need to learn the different ways that the, the di divine direction comes. Of course, God uses his word first and foremost. He'll never leave you, lead you outside of your word outside of his word. So if you hear something from someone that doesn't line up with the word of God, don't receive that because God and the Holy Spirit always agree. They're always one. But God sets New Testament prophets in the church to confirm what God is already doing in your life. It's a big difference. Usually, even in my own life, when I've received a true word from God, usually it's come through a prophet or an apostle um, or even through a stranger Okay, you don't have to be in a fivefold ministry gift to be used in the gift of prophecy. It'll come at a time when you need it the most. But you're looking to for God, you're looking to God for direction and you're confused and that's when God will come around and use the word of confirmation to straighten out things in your life. To say let's clear the fog, let's set you straight on this. I'm confused, Lord, right? So the word of confirmation is used in the gift of prophecy. Now, there's another side to prophecy that can warn people. And I'm not going to get into that tonight because I don't have time. But mainly, in the New Testament, prophecy is used to build up, encourage, and get strength in your destiny in the Lord. 
and we all need a word of encouragement because if we lose our joy, we lose our, our motivation, we lose our strength, we, we feel like giving up and quitting. And I found in my own life that usually at a point in my life where I was that discouraged, that's when God sent me an incredible word. But this is the other thing on that. That word will carry you through the rough waters that are ahead of you. That word that Mary received from Elizabeth and Simeon, because we have no idea what the mother of Jesus went through giving birth to the Savior of the world. You have no idea what she went through, because one of the th uh, things that Simeon said to her is a sword shall pierce your soul because of the rejection he's going to have. But then he said, but the greatest joy of many others and the deepest thoughts of many shall be revealed. It says in Hebrews that the word of God is quick and powerful and it's sharper than a double-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirits and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Part of the gifting in the New Testament prophet is we can read men's thoughts. When you read in the Gospels where it says Jesus knew their thoughts and he answered them before he, they even asked him the question. Because that's part of the gifting. Okay, but it's never to put someone down. But it's to show them that, hey, I, I'm going to answer just what you were thinking. Okay, and that's what it says about Jesus here. But it says the word of God is a double-edged sword. There's the number two. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word of God in your life and my life is established. Where two or more are gathered in his name, Jesus Christ is in the midst of us to confirm what he wants to confirm in your life, in your life, and in my life. He always will use a word of confirmation several times in your life in the most important things and even the things that don't seem important to you. Because God is very concerned about every little detail of your life. But when it comes to the major things, he doesn't want us to miss it. He wants us to fill, fulfill our destiny. He wants us to fulfill our calling. He wants us to let our light shine and glorify his name so that we you know, can bring others to Christ. It's all about bringing others to Christ. So that's the other thing I want to end on, is if, in a word, everything's got to exalt Jesus Christ. If it draws attention to a man, then you know, push it aside. Everything has to be uh, drawn and lifted up Jesus Christ. And this is the other thing. We cannot use, uh, we can't become a hireling in our gifting and, and try to charge people for a word. Very dangerous grounds with God. Very dangerous grounds with God. You know, if the ministry is good and the ministry is excellent and people are receiving and there's lots of fruit, people are going to give to that ministry. We don't need to have a big appeal for money. And we don't need to have a, you know, become an auction. Okay? That's very dangerous ground. There's three things that will take a ministry down. And one of them is, is taking the glory. The other one is using money in the wrong way. Manipulating God's people for money off of their anointing or their gifting. Okay? It's dangerous ground with God. I believe in Jesus' ministry because his ministry was so incredibly excellent. He, he, that's why you never saw anything about even taking up an offering. Because people just gave because of what was happening. So in our own ministry, God knows that we all need finances. And he's also pro promised to provide us with everything that we need. He is the God that's more than enough. Okay, But we should never put a, a price or, or, uh, or a, a money charge on the gifting of God in us. Jesus said, freely you have received, now freely give. Amen.